Well, first, the first step is to identify where you've gone wrong in your health. Sorry. So, for example, if you're starting to feel symptoms of something, you have to check in with your body and say, "Was I? Have I been eating okay lately? Have I been sleeping enough? Like, have my emotions been erratic?" Have I been stewing anger inside of myself? Have I not been exercising? Have I been drinking enough water? Am I chronically dehydrated? So the first step is always to ask questions, and that's what a practitioner, a good practitioner, will do is start asking them these questions. Are you constipated? Are you, uh, you know, are all your lifestyle factors need to be looked at? Where are you going wrong here? Okay. Yeah, and that's what I did because still i'm struggling with health issues and i know that the environmental factors really are a stressor and that's why i applied for disability support to get that sorted out because obviously the job i was doing is not really made for an autistic it's irregular shifts and then it's a noisy er environment and so on so i pulled through all these years but then you come to a point where you say i can't do it anymore it's it's too much it's too stressful and I cannot take care of my health like that because that's a constant stressor. If you have a bank account and all the things you are doing, looking after your health, they put money into your bank account, but then you have a stressor and constantly the money you put in gets lost, basically. So, yeah, I'm being evaluated and they will test my capacity, how much I can work at the present moment. And then I will also get evaluated for what talents there actually are and in which direction it should go in education and this will take several months but then i hope i will finally be on the other side of this tunnel but meanwhile i can still look after my health in the best ways possible so i decided to include more organ meats into my diet however it is hard to get all they sell is liver and all the other organ meats it's hard to find here but there is a possibility ancestral supplements they are not cheap but they are high quality and now they have a new one grass-fed placenta So I decided to try that. Nourish your way to health and happiness with grass-fed placenta. For most of human history, we effortlessly consumed nose to tail as we needed for strength, health and happiness, like the fertile ground that we once walked upon. We were a natural extension of this earth, always grounded, always connected. Just look at them. That's how a healthy human being is supposed to look like. And he is older. Look how well built he is. And those beautiful teeth they had. 
Bruce Lee said, don't speak negatively about yourself, even as a joke. Your body doesn't know the difference. Words are energy and cast spells. That's why it's called spelling. Change the way you speak about yourself and you can change your life. What you're not changing, you're also choosing. In the modern world, we unknowingly struggle to fulfill our nutritional needs, to support and sustain a vibrant, disease-free life. We are now part of a world where our fertility, hormone, immune, skin and postpartum health is ailing. The solution is to address the root cause with dietary, lifestyle and behavioral choices while nourishing and supporting our bodies and brains. With proven anthropological ways that are backed by modern science. This includes the consumption of grass-fed beef placenta. We evolved eating all parts of the animal. Our ancestors intuitively knew where to find good medicine. They were in constant connection with the animal and plant kingdoms. They were able to deeply understand the transformative cycles of birth, crows and death through observation and their own inner knowing. They could sense something profoundly rejuvenating within the placenta that would lead even herbivorous animals to consume their own afterbirths. It's no wonder that our early ancestors were also consuming this nourishing superorgan when they had access to it. Dietary, medicinal and spiritual uses of both animal and human placenta in prehistoric civilizations was already well established as early as the ancient Egyptians. Starting in the 16th century, primitive Comanche mastered abandoned Spanish horses to hunt buffalo, either by lances, arrows or driven over a cliff, elite Comanche hunters efficiently took down stampeding buffalo from horseback and ate the best organs themselves. Comanche women did all the skilled labor required to break down, cook, dry and process every other part of these sacred animals. Then they loaded an incredible variety of life-giving products, literally from nose to tail, and hauled them back to camp. As they worked, they chewed on fresh organ meats, including the placenta of fetal buffalo calves. When Comanche and other Great Plain tribes brought home a pregnant heifer buffalo, a special stew was prepared from the fetal calf along with the placenta. It was probably similar to modern menudo and used the buffalo's stomach as a stockpot. We know from our ancestors' beliefs like supports like. This nutritious stew would have been potent medicine given to expectant and nursing mothers. And now we vaccinate them. Just think about this for a few seconds. As late as the 19th century, when the Bureau of Indian Affairs catalogued all of the ways a Plains Indian woman would use cattle, the fetal calf and placenta stew was catalogued. Our ancestors not only knew the nutritional value of the placenta, but they recognized its spiritual value as well. The placenta brings new life into the world and is the active interface of the most biologically 
intimate connection between two living organisms. Our ancestors believed the placenta represented part of the new child cell. Many native people worldwide ritually bury their infant's placenta to fertilize a new sapling, which acts as a guardian spirit for the child as they grow together. In one of America's earliest gender reveal ceremonies, women of the Cheyenne tribe would sew the placenta with medicine herbs into a pouch, shaped like a long-lived turtle for babies girls and a regenerating lizard for boys. The Sioux had a similar practice. They kept this amulet with them their whole lives, and it was their most powerful protective charm, often soon into closing by their mother. The Arikara tribe hang these naval amulets from the sacred buffalo berry bushes dotting the Dakota's Great Plains to bless their babies. Natives believed that their placenta was a helpful ancestor or spirit win, and they gave the placenta another purpose, instead of simply discarding it as a medical waste product. There is now some thought being given to bringing back the widespread ancient custom of ritual placenta disposal and consumption which has been totally dismissed and disrespected in our modern hospitals. The Cheyenne said that a child who did not ha have a naval amulet would always be looking for his or her soul. Benefits of grass-fed placenta Made up of fetal membranes, amniotic sac, and umbilicus, the placenta supports the growth of a fertilized egg into a fully formed infant. A fertilized egg emerges from the fallopian tube as a group of rapidly dividing cells called the embryo. When the embryo reaches the uterine wall, several of these cells embed themselves into mother's tissue. These cells will grow into the placenta, while the cells that remain inside the uterus will become the fetus. Technically, the placenta does not belong to the mother. Her body may create it, but it is part of the developing child. It is made up of 50% genetic material from the father, created from just sperm and egg. The placenta develops without any nerve cells. That means that the placenta functions on its own without being controlled by the mother's brain. Incredible! Consuming placenta benefits a new mother by supplying her with heme iron, amino acids, essential fats, stem cells. This is the most important thing and gross factors. Our functional healthcare practitioners have reported that mothers who consume placenta after birth bleed significantly less, have an elevated mood and more energy. Elevated mood, right? So probably no postpartum depression. And everybody's a little bit different. So you know, a lot of people go, this is better, this diet's better than that bad diet and all these things all the time. And I don't even get involved with that. Because you know what, for somebody that diet might be good and for somebody else that diet might be terrible. Which brings me back to the lectins. Plant lectins in particular. So there was this study. Dietary lectins and Parkinson disease. Recently, it has been suggested that ingested environmental toxins may trigger 
a series of events starting in the gastrointestinal tract that eventually result in Parkinson's disease. In particular, the response to micro injections of tyramine, a drug whose mechanism of action includes the release of dopamine in brain areas, is reduced significantly in the lectin fed animals. We interpreted this data as an indication of altered dopaminergic functionality similar to what is seen in PD patients. The present project will test the hypothesis that lectins, a chemical component of many dietary plants, may themselves be the environmental toxin, or by virtue of their properties, may facilitate the entry into the brain of an unknown pathogen responsible for the development of gastrointestinal dysfunctions in environmentally related Parkinson's disease. We observe that, indeed, degeneration of the substantia nigra induced gastric dysmotility that was reminiscent of that in PD patients. The gastric dysmotility was accompanied by severe alterations of the physiology and neurochemistry of the brain-gut axis. Let that sink in. And therefore, I'm avoiding plant lectins. As you know, I used to be a vegetarian and a vegan. And I had this meal every lunch practically. It contained of so-called very healthy food. It was brown rice, organic vegetables and usually tofu and a sauce made of olive oil and tamari. And after every such meal, which is actually a lectin bomb, I was so dead. I couldn't really move or do anything because I had absolutely no energy, nothing. And one time it was so bad I had a catatonic freeze. For about 30 minutes I was unable to move or speak. I just sat there and sat there and did nothing because I couldn't move. I was frozen in my body. That was really a scary experience. And then after 30 minutes my brain came basically back online. It had recovered and then I could move again as if nothing had happened. And back then, that was in 2007 when I had the burnout, I didn't know what was the reason for this. It just happened and I had no idea about it. But now I guess it was really the lectins, the plant lectins from my food. And that's why I will not eat those lectins anymore from plants. And we need to honor that and respect that. Depends on where you live, depends on how you grew up, depends on your gut microbiome, depends on all, all these factors. Okay? I have a specific blood type that's aligned with that. I grew up that way. That's how I feel good. Another person might not. They might need it. So it's, it's, it's no right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's what's right for you. 
Yeah, that's individualized medicine. So identifying those factors is step one. Step two is um, the tough part because this is where a lot of people come to me and say, I'm completely overwhelmed. There's so many ways I can do this. <laughs> that's what's incredible. And that's what's outrageous that the medical establishment can't even take a drop of the bucket of the hundreds of thousands of natural remedies that exist on this earth. How embarrassing for them. I mean, it's terrible. They can't even open the box a little and go like, you know, they, what, they'll reach out to one of the worst supplements, which is calcium. It would be like a big chalk, piece of chalk to swallow. That's as far as they'll go, you know. <laughs> um, but they, they can't because if they open that, they're done, right? So then it would be like, what are the minor basics that are essentials to my health? Well, the vitamins and minerals. So either you're going to change your food, so you're getting more vitamins and minerals, you're eating organic, you're growing your own, you're eating them fresher, you're learning how to eat better to get those vitamins and minerals, or you're having to supplement, you're having to find ways to do it through other means, and there's so many, that's the thing, right? Like, things that I go to again and again, after so many years of doing this, it's, it's actually whittled down a bit, which is interesting. Um, I find people are chronically magnesium deficient, um, and we don't absorb it well through the gut. So we always suggest topical, either Epsom salt baths or topical spray. We're chronically deficient in B vitamins because we're always stressed. Um, so taking a B multi is a good preventative to do as a rule. Um, if you're not living seed side, I see chronic iodine deficiencies despite the salt that they fortify with iodine, which is garbage. And a lot of people will switch out for that salt and still not get enough, mm -hmm. uh, especially women. And uh, in certain women, iron, I see a lot of iron deficiencies going on. Um, and uh, copper deficiencies in men, I'm seeing quite a bit as well. And then also sulfur, sulfur deficiencies. So um, DMSO, MMS, uh, sorry, MSM, sulfur, those things to bring that back and bring the tissue back into integrity. Um, and then you'll get into sort of micro minerals, things like boron. I've seen a lot of boron deficiencies as well, um, even selenium in some cases. So we're seeing um, also vitamin C. It's incredible and zinc. These, these things are, you got you to gotta check them off the list and go, do I have enough of these things? In the winter, are you keeping D or am I getting enough D, right? And I know a lot of people, especially I live in the UK, I'm here in Germany at the moment, and they're chem trailing every day, there is no sunshine, everyone's vitamin D deficient. How would you suggest if somebody lives in a country like that, I'm, I'm, I think Canada may be the same, um, how does somebody get their vitamin D? Well, I mean, obviously, the, the amount of sunlight you need to get per day is at least 15 to 20 minutes of the majority of your skin. Okay. So that's your sort of barometer. Have I gotten 15 minutes of almost total body sun? Then you'll, you'll be enough for you if you were in health. But then the problem is vitamin D is the backbone of all our hormones. And we also have hormone um, mimicking, modulating chemicals that are thrown at us left, right, and center. That, that means if we need more D than we would under normal circumstances. And that, so it changes from case to case and how much is required. Now there's vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Um, D2 is considered better, but it doesn't store well. That's the problem. Um, you can get it through animal products and you can get it through like fish oils and these sorts of things. Um, but I generally, personally, I take a D with K2. For example, emu oil? Nature is stronger than any human design. The ingredients within foods work synergistically. They work as teams to feed cells. Isolated and synthetic vitamins contain only a fraction of the vitamin complexes and lack the cofactors and micronutrients found in nature. Whole food and whole food supplements provide all these synergies cofactors, vitamin complexes and 
energy that normally occur in food and make them work at their optimal. This cannot be duplicated in a laboratory. It is proven to be unadulterated, effective and nutrient dense with high biological activity. The active ingredients in emu oil are omega 3, 6, 7 and 9, vitamin K2, MK4, vitamin D3, vitamin E and conjugated linoleic acid. So this company is really great but it's a bit pricey so I have found another source here in Switzerland and it is a liquid oil used for cosmetics but because it is pure and has nothing else in it I can actually take it internally. We also tend to be deficient in vitamin K2, which is essential for shuttling calcium into our bone matrix so we don't get bone loss. Um, and so I take a, a, like a liquid supplement, which I find better absorbed, um, or you do sublinguals, so you do it absorbed through the mouth. Um, and that generally I do about I would say 5,000 international units as the lower end of it. You can go pretty high if you need to. Especially in cases like cancer, you need to go pretty high, even up to yeah. 20,000 or so international units, like orthomolecular doses, which are yeah. therapeutic doses of things. So you can do, do things like that. I think I remember in, in uh, naturopathic college, there was this running joke that, you know, if you eat a polar bear liver, you can die of vitamin D toxicity. <laughs> That's the most amount of vitamin D of yeah. anything <laughs> because they absorb so much sun. Mm. through their black skin and so they they store a lot of it and they use yes. a lot of it. Wow, crazy. In Canada here, we're chronically D deficient to the point where the doctors won't even test for it anymore. They just assume you are. That's wow. it. They won't even pay for the test. They're just like, yeah, you mm. just take it because you probably are. <laughs> so so then there's, there's all that. And that's a huge – what I suggest is get a few good – well-rounded books you know, that you have with you, not just internet searches. Like have a couple of books you like. Get a good herbal compendium. Mm -hmm. um, get a good uh, a general nutritional book that has everything in it, right? And get a good homeopathic book. Mm -hmm. If you have those three, then you can go to the condition that this is how I started actually learning. I felt whatever, or somebody said they felt whatever, I go to the book and open to that category and read. And yeah. then we'll launch off from there, right? Like so back in the old days. Yeah. And then start playing around with it. And now we have this season that you can go and learn the plants that grow around you. I always suggest people to do that. We have plantain everywhere, dandelion everywhere. I mean, yarrow. I mean, these plants are potent. And you said something about fever, I just wanted to mention, you never ever suppress a fever, okay? So the fever is your healing mechanism. The symptoms that you're experiencing are the healing mechanism. You see. This is the issue in the medical cult. Is they see the symptom as the problem that must be eradicated at all costs. Rather than honoring the fact that the symptom is the brilliance of the body doing the work of healing it. And so you want to understand why it's doing that symptom, and then you want to support that situation. Buffer it. You might have to buffer it. You might have to guide it. You might need to feed it with the right nutrition so it can go through the process in an appropriate amount of time. Yeah. Right? But you don't just clamp it down mm -hmm. because the body will eventually, well, screw this. We're going to do a workaround now with all this. And usually that workaround is stronger and harder on the body, using more of its precious energy, right? And so the repercussions, that's what they call side effects. And I'm currently still trying to find a solution for all of that. And I do everything I can.
and you also have to look at the environment because nutritionally I really do all I can. I now started to eat liver daily. It's so very cheap here. It's actually pork liver, which I like more than the taste of beef liver. And I have it every day. And it really is very energizing. So this is pork, liver, goose fat, and dog fat. And I freeze my meat because of the histamine intolerance. That's the best way to eat it. So this is frozen. And then I slowly cook it in animal fats. And this way of eating has proven to be the best for my body right now. I cannot do any bone broth or pemmican or bacon or any other processed meat. It needs to be absolutely fresh, frozen into the pan and eaten immediately. Minus the green stuff, of course. I absolutely hate dill. Ugh. But um, the liver. So nutritious. Did you know that liver is practically nature's multivitamin? Liver is nature's most nutrient-dense superfood. Only meaningful source of vitamin A. Rich in heme iron. B12 and folate supports energy demands. Why beef liver or other animal liver should be included? I actually did the same, mostly ate muscle meats and rarely the organs. So if I supplement with B vitamins, I for sure will see the difference. And I am always very tired if I don't supplement with B vitamins. But now as I added the liver back in. I might be able to cut down on the supplementing. Liver has all the important B vitamins you would need. Thiamine, B2, B3, B5, B6, folate, very important, and B12 the one that vegans usually lack. What I noticed recently, it's probably through the hormonal changes I'm going through at the moment, but my skin has become a little bit drier than usual. And therefore, Eating liver on a daily basis seems like a very good idea, right? And where else would you get your vitamin A? Also, you have the vitamin K2, which is really important, as we know now. Vitamin K2 helps with calcium balance, an essential nutrient for bone health. We know insufficient calcium intake can result in low bone mineral density and ultimately increase the risk of fracture. And the calcium supplement that doesn't work so well. 
K2 helps direct calcium into the bones and keeps it out of the arterial walls. Calcium in the arterial walls can be very, very bad. Calcifications on arterial walls essentially, which will cause heart disease. So if you want strong bones and not stiff arteries, K2 is an essential nutrient. And you can definitely get used to the taste. Liver can actually also help your brain. Choline is the front runner for nutrients associated with brain health. And a single serving of liver about the size of a deck of cards has almost all the choline you need for the day. Research shows that choline improves cognitive performance and prevents anxiety and mood disorders. Choline is so imperative for a healthy functioning brain that deficiencies are associated with the most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's disease. The brain relies on oxygen and nutrients via the cardiovascular system, which is made up of veins and arteries that act like highways to the brain and other parts of the body. When arteries start to build up plaque, brain function can suffer. Copper is required to balance zinc in the diet. Experts suggest the ratio of 8 to 1 is ideal. Most people, particularly on a carnivore diet, get enough zinc but not enough copper. Liver is a good source of iron, the most common micronutrient deficiency in the world. Iron is required for the synthesis creation of neurotransmitters and it helps prevent oxidative damage to the tissues of the brain. Finally, liver is a good source of selenium. A study published in the Journal of Nutrition found that optimum serum selenium levels were associated with a decrease in depressive symptoms and improved mood. Eating liver may support muscle growth. And for me, I really have an issue building muscles for some reason. It might be genetic because already my dad um, he was very much into sports, but you would not see much muscle build up in his body, but that might be because his diet was so shitty. I don't know about that, but, well, for that reason alone, I started to include liver daily. Beef liver is packed with nutrients and protein that your muscles need to grow. The best part, unlike all other protein supplements, it's just meat. No carbs, no fillers, no bullshit. Yeah, that's great. Not that I want to look like this. I'm fine with that. But I want to prevent a loss of muscle tissue. Let's see. So last time when I did my blood work, um, they found a molybdenum deficiency which is actually rare and that's one more reason to eat liver on a daily basis and for autistics especially we have a hard time to detox 
at least most of us, and therefore it is good to eat liver because it reduces toxic load. And juice cleanses, really forget about them. For me, it did not work. It made me bloated and I did not feel any better. Only after I switched to a meat-based diet, I felt a real big difference. Liver may be a better detox plan. The answer is molybdenum. Molybdenum is a trace essential mineral found in high amounts in organ meats, especially liver. Eating liver is certainly not as pretty as the rainbow array of perfectly filled detox juice bottles, but the proof is in the pudding. So, all I add here is salt. Finished, ready to eat. Bon appétit! How does it work? It acts as a coenzyme supporting the conversion of sulfites to sulfates and supporting the metabolism of medications and alcohol. The buildup of sulfites is toxic to the body and too much can be dangerous. Liver is high in antioxidants. Liver is rich in antioxidants A, C and E. Antioxidants protect cells against oxidative stress, also known as damage from free radicals like UV rays, smoking, inhaling pollution, inflammation, poor diet and stress. Antioxidants can be thought of as the protectors of cells. When a cell is damaged, it has the potential to become a cancer cell. Preventing cellular damage in the first place is the essence of every cancer prevention strategy. Eating nutrient-rich foods, not smoking, wearing sunscreen, etc. The organs of the immune system need a constant supply of vitamin A to produce cells that help to fight off infections in the body. Research shows that vitamin A reduces infection and deaths of many serious illnesses, including tuberculosis, pneumonia, measles and malaria. Especially Native American tribes loved to eat organ meats. Our ancestors knew it, but nowadays nobody talks about that. Liver was essential to evolution. It was reserved for those first who needed nutrients the most, pregnant women and children. People pounced on it like kids on Kit Kat bars today. They just knew they felt better when they did. But now we've forgotten and lost our roots. We're hairless apes transported to a modern arcade. Staples of society have been transformed into junk. Instead of liver, we drink watered down toxic kale smoothies. We take pills. But liver is unique in its nutritional benefits. Adding it is like superhuman putting on his cape. It will transform you, strip away layers of comfort, build up your cells fresh. And recently I switched to 
pork because it's just cheaper and I'm really on a budget. And it costs a third of beef price. So, yeah. It's okay. For the moment, I just eat pork. Has a nice taste as well. 